My copy of this book, as you can see, is a mess because I've been reading it. And I've been reading it a lot. And I keep it handy so that I can hold it close. And, and before we started um, today, Dee was, I, I know I have boogers in my nose. Um, <laughs> it's very, attra it's very, <laughs> very attractive on camera. Oh, OK. Um, oh. Um, before we started, you know, I'm, I'm going to go and I'm going to list here for you all of Dee's credits. Um, but I'm going to list a few of Dee's credits. But what, what a lot of you might not know is that Dee, Dee is actually a healer. And she was talking to me for less than five minutes before we started. And it was absolutely transformative. And I'm reminding you now, Dee, that while you're up here to teach us that breathing thing, maybe even before you start, because I need to hear it. And I think a lot of women in here do too. And maybe even a couple of rock boys. Um, okay, Dee has worked as an author, teacher, dancer, and actress in film, television, and stage for over 30 years. With over 100 credits to her name, Ms. Wallace is a true tour de force, working with countless directors, producers, and some of Hollywood's biggest names, including Steven Spielberg, Peter Jackson, Wes Craven, Joe Dante, Stephen King, and Blake Edwards. Dee's career began in New York, where she studied with Uta Hagen before moving to L.A., where she continued to hone her craft. Her many feature film credits include The Hills Have Eyes, The Howling, Cujo, Secret Admirer, The Frighteners, Ten, and most notably, her starring role in one of America's most celebrated films, E.T., The Extraterrestrial. <laughs> Ellie, it's Mommy! <laughs> oh, God. I confess to having watched it three more times in the last three weeks. I kid you not. Just Saturday, I was working out, and I flipped, and it was on the scene where Dee is in that leopard. It's Halloween, and she's in that little outfit, and she's running with the little camera. And so I'm hooked, and I'm there, and I'm watching the rest of the movie. Uh, she was recently featured in the new remake of Rob Zombie's ha Halloween. Her countless television credits add only more cachet to an already illustrious acting career, with starring roles in over 20 movies of the week and four hit television series, including her most recent portrayal as a passive-aggressive matriarch in a very dysfunctional family in the ABC comedy Sons and Daughters. Other recent television credits include Grey's Anatomy, Cold Case, Without a Trace, Ghost Whisperer, and a recurring role on My Name is Earl. As a much sought after celebrity and renowned actress, Dee has appeared on every major news and talk show and has appeared on E! Hollywood True Stories, Oprah, and The O'Reilly Factor. Her speaking engagements include numerous national and inter international venues, including the, Lo Na the Love Harmony Forum in Tokyo, the Dillon Lecture Series, the Kansas Film Commission, Spirit Works, Energetic Healing. On a weekly basis, Dee conducts numerous private healing sessions at her office in Woodland Hills, California. I hope you have cards with you. As an author, Dee has written a book devoted to the art of self-healing. She conducts monthly workshops to introduce people to the healing techniques outlined in her book, Conscious Creation. In addition to her ongoing work with fellow actors as an acting teacher and mentor, Dee devotes all of her extra time to her beautiful daughter, Gabrielle, and to empowering women. Most notably for me is that when Dee showed up here last spring, she sat amongst us, one of us. No airs, no hint of self-importance. She was accessible, warm, loving, laughing, and healing. She reached out to more than one woman in need that day. She's a woman's woman, and I'm honored to have her today. <laughs> oh, so emotional. <laughs> You are. Thank you. All right. I need your glasses. Okay, I'm giving you my glasses. And here's your copy of the book. Thank you. Oh, watch my Ouija. Your Ouija? My Ouija. I call it my Ouija. I'm going to like speed through everything because I have to leave by 2 or 2.15 and I want to try and get everything in. So uh, I want to just speak hi, my best side. <laughs> Uh, a, a moment about the healing work. I can tell you what's up for everybody right now in the collective consciousness is moving into your power. And why we're afraid of moving into our power is that many times in our past lives, when we've really moved into our power, we've really fucked it up and um, destroyed everything, basically. 
And that's kind of what, especially the feminine energy is coming back big time right now to balance out all of our divine instincts. But without the power of the masculine behind it, the child doesn't get born. So you must move into your power and embrace the knowing that you're in charge of your own energy, that you're responsible for creating your own life. If you don't do it, nobody else is going to do it for you. Nobody. Not me, not another healer, not another astrologer, not anybody. If you do not take responsibility yourself for the information they bring forward to you. Uh, what we were talking about earlier is most of us are still talking to something out there and thinking it's going to do it or it's keeping us from doing it and that's just not true. Uh, like they said at the end of The Wizard of Oz, you have the power all along, Dorothy. That's the message of E.T. That's the message of Peter Pan. We've been hearing it for eons. And we still want to give our power away. We want to make it somebody else's fault or somebody else's responsibility. Which is why I wrote Bright Light. Because I gave my power away big time to people who hurt me in my life. So, before I start reading, I just ask you, who did you give yours away to? Your mom, your dad, somebody in business, your significant other, who hurt you, and who did you give your power away to? Because you are the only one that can get it back. Most of them are dead, or they don't care anyway. you are the only ones that can claim your power again. And we're supposed to be the ones, the Western women, who will be the power to come forward and save the world. But not if we keep listening to our stories. We all have our stories. We heard a lot of them today. My story is, I grew up in a very poor household. My father was a severe alcoholic all my life, ended up trying to kill himself twice in my bed. Freud would have a ball with that. And um, finally blew his brains out behind a bar. That's my story. If I give it any power, that's my responsibility. If I keep defining myself by my story, I don't move into the power and the definition of who I want to be today. And a lot of artists, because we think our stories give us a lot of fuel, and because genetically artists believe they have to fucking suffer to make it, we don't move into our power. If we're going to use our suffering in our stories, let's write about it with the message that we have to move on from all the stories and live the lives we want to live now. He said, I'm, I'm, I picked a really short place today. Bright Light is my journey as an actor and a an actress. Through my career, I tell a lot of great, funny, pathetic, <laughs> moving stories about all the people that I've worked with, all the great actors and directors. And it occurred to me when I was starting to write the book that my acting technique was a direct metaphor for the creation technique itself. So throughout the book, um, are all of the life lessons and spiritual lessons that I put together really about creation itself. So this chapter is 
is about some time I spent with my acting mentor and guru, Charles Conrad. I studied with Uta Hagen, I studied with Jeff Corey, I studied with a lot of big icons. But it wasn't until I met Charles who said, don't think about anything, don't break down anything, don't look at the beats, read it one time and get up and become a channel. And my life changed. Thirty years later, I realized if I just lived my fucking life the way I acted, I would have been there a long time ago. <clears throat> so this is Chapter 3, The High Energy Zone. As I look back in those years at the Conrad Studio, it was like Camelot, the beginning of a new era in my life and in the art of acting as a metaphor for living life from the heart. It was there that I learned a technique that solidified my natural approach to acting and would hold me steady in the midst of laborious rehearsals, method actors, angry directors, egotistical producers, some uneducated casting directors, and my own fears. It was my compass in the storm, the yellow brick road, that always took me back to Oz. I knew there was gold at the end of this ro road, and like E.T., I was making my way to the home of me. But the travel was often laborious and frustrating. There were months of auditioning with no real bookings and therefore no income. I tried a brief stint at waitressing, but in a town full of professional actor waiters, I was way outmatched. I used my teaching degree to do some private tutoring and I taught several classes at a wonderful dance studio, including a class on musical comedy. We had a great time performing funny renditions of everything from one singular sensation to you've got to pick a pocket or two from Oliver. And I still knew that I was going to make it, but the financial strain of getting there was exhausting. Anybody identify? <laughs> the Conrad Studio was my salvation and I was more than willing to eat peanut butter sandwiches to pay for it. One of the most important dictums of the Conrad process was discipline. Charles was big on discipline. You had to be there 15 minutes before class was scheduled to start. Pick up your scene at check-in, handle any payment issues, and read your scene to move into the focused energy that you were to bring to the reading. If you were late and didn't call, you didn't work. And you got reamed royally. Those may sound like very simple rules, but it was amazing how people fought them. Some of the students felt like they were being treated like children and not allowed to handle this preparation as their responsibility. They would arrive in the nick of time, prepare their scene while others were working, and be late enough with payments to create disharmony with the assistant. So I just lovingly ask you to ask yourselves if you have any of those little traits going on. Because as you define yourself, you define the world you live in and the reality of your life. At first, none of us realized that the lesson started before you even arrived at class. It wasn't until I was well into studying with Charles that I grasped that maintaining discipline and that being punctual was an intricate part of his entire acting technique. If you were too scattered or undisciplined to be on time, how could you then be in the moment for your performance here or on the set? And as in life, you have to show up, preferably on time because... God helps them who helps themselves. I never really absorbed the meaning of that saying until it was presented from an energy standpoint. If you don't hold the intention and belief, it's impossible for the manifestation to follow. So shut up, show up, and do the work. So again, if we're relying on anything out there, we are not directing our own presence to create what it is we want. I had never had any spiritual training. I had grown up in a religious family and had received instruction, but it never occurred to me 
that there was a difference. I had heard the word Buddhist. I'm from Kansas City, okay? <laughs> but I had never been exposed to their beliefs or met any Buddhists in the good old Kansas City of that era. If my family had interacted with any Jewish people, it was a cold day in hell. <laughs> so I had no way of connecting discipline practices with spirituality as it is found in these religions. I did, however, know about discipline. I had been a dancer for years and studied with a prima ballerina from Germany. Oh yes, I knew a lot about discipline. But it wasn't until I was required to read Zen in the Art of Archery that I began to understand Charles' general approach to acting as a discipline. And acting is just life, because the greatest creation we do is life. That book resonated with who I was, what I had always known, and how I had always lived. Being from Kansas, I just didn't know that some ancient traditions had created systems of thought around the concept of beingness. Wow, I was a Methodist practicing Buddhism and I didn't even know it. <laughs> My approach was totally unconscious and haphazard, but I knew it because it came naturally to me. The task here and in life was to find a consistent approach, a standard to apply in all cases. And it was painfully clear in class when any of the students were fighting this approach. Zen and the Art of Archery was about the journey of a novice archer from the West learning how to shoot a bow from the Zen way of thinking, which meant no thinking at all, which is really important for the creative process. No thinking. Your consciousness is your intelligence. For months, the teacher made the young man just hold the bow, then the arrow, and then the bow and the arrow together. For months, he wasn't allowed to shoot the arrow. Be at one with the bow, the master would instruct him. Don't think about your equipment. Don't think about hitting the target. Don't think about the intention. Just be one with the tools. This approach to acting was an enormous challenge for actors who had come from the method school of acting and university programs. It's just a really big challenge for all of us in life because we've been taught that our minds save us. And our minds are really used to troubleshoot and create doubt, which takes us out of our power. They had been taught to break everything down and to think, think, think about what the material meant and what the subtext was and how to bring it to life. <laughs> Finding the acting beats was where everything started and ended. And for them, Charles' method of not thinking the scene through was like soldiers walking across a field in a foreign land where buried mines and snipers existed. What you didn't know wasn't safe. And so many clung to what they did know, the method. And that was a death knell with the Conrad technique. One of the key precepts was being able to raise your energy from the mental level to the high energy zone where you connected to a greater whole and its life energies. It's where the flow happens. In other words, you move into the channel. I fondly remember a student who eventually became a good friend who struggled with this approach right from the start. Class was set up with four rows of chairs, each row a bit higher for maximum viewing. Charles sat in the middle of the front row and everyone knew not to sit behind or beside him because any movement could break his focus and put him through the roof. There were two chairs and a table in front of him about three feet away and the lights would highlight the actors. It was all terribly dramatic. But nothing compared to what actually happened on that stage. 
So that night, my friend made his way to the table and sat down next to his partner, picked up a scene and dove right into it. Before he even got a word out, Charles stopped him. What are you doing? What do you mean, the actor asked. What are you doing? Charles asked again impatiently. I'm, I'm beginning the scene. How, he asked. I'm getting ready to tell her goodbye. How do you know that, Charles asked. What? How do you know that, <laughs> Charles asked in a louder voice, becoming more excited. I saw my friend freeze because I read the scene, he said in exasperation. No, he shouted. Charles looked like he was going to physically attack him. You fucking know that because your energy is so high that it's taken out of your fucking head and you are living in the fucking moment. <laughs> he paused for a second. And don't start again without your energy high. We had all stopped breathing at that point <laughs> and had put ourselves in that hot seat. My friend tried to regain his composure and begin. His energy was sure as hell up there now. He took a deep breath and what happened next stunned us all. His partner reached over and slapped him hard and he broke down into tears. And then he looked up and he told her that he was leaving her with such pathos that it stopped her cold. It was fucking perfect. Perfect and beautiful and absolutely stunning. Not in a million years could your intellectual mind have figured out how to play that beat in that way. The scene ended, the class applauded, and then the guy stood up, glared at Charles, and angrily exclaimed, I'm out of here. This is bullshit, and it's not for me. No, I thought, this approach is not for weak souls, and only for authentic explorers of their own truth. Thank you. What? Uh, yeah, I, I kind of want to do one other thing, just for a minute. So, um, again, there's some really funny parts like learning you could use birdseed in your bra to make your boobs look bigger and stuff like that. <laughs> Who knew? Who knew? Really? So I, I kind of really quickly would like to give you an example of my work that I do uh, that led me to reading this book. So if anybody has a block uh, that they're trying to get through right now, either creatively or business-wise or anything, and you'd like to share it, um, um, I'll do some of the healing work and uh, maybe we can get to an answer for you. Yeah. Okay, uh, well, I told you what it was, and it is, Vicki, your understanding of what your I am presence is, is still outside of you. And you keep depending on outside energy. But when I was listening to your reading, if you just read the part over, again to yourself that you read today, you'll find many answers. Because, hold on, <clears throat> I am divine love is the way that I balance everything. Money, power, love, acceptance, and really that word, bliss, have all gotten collapsed together in a yin-yang pull, pull push place for you. 
And it was very clear for you who were, when we listened to what you read, <clears throat> the separation of, okay, am I going to core belief? Hold on a minute. These are a compilation of pages that I have worked with for 15 years, and they're all on here. So I'm going to core belief, this page, this page, here, here. oh, that one. Okay. Um, basically, the core belief that you're, that's running you right now is I have to sabotage what I already have. So anytime you create anything, or it's almost here, you have to sabotage it monetarily. Um, your mother was a perfect, but it's way genetic. It goes way back, the whole lineage of your mom, which is your feminine side. Okay? Um, so the feminine side of you, which gets all these amazing divine hits and ideas and everything, um, is threatened by the masculine side, which is the power. And if your masculine and feminine aren't working together, I mean, if you think of it, uh, guys, in the context of a baby, that the feminine and the masculine, the minute the egg and the sperm come together, the child's conceived. It's the same way in a divine idea or a creation of anything we do in our life. When the idea and the power to bring the idea forward, meet harmoniously, the creation happens. But it's, it's the power right now that you're all in resistance to. And if you're clear that your intention in your power is to always be propelled by divine love, you cannot misuse your power. Unfortunately, most have been taught that to be more powerful, we should be unpowerful. That that's our definition, you know, that um, when we were the good little wives baking the cookies in the households, right, genetically, that's who had the power. Well, the world's changed. We don't want to be those women anymore, but we also don't want to lose that part. So anything, any part of us that we are resisting is sabotaging the, the whole of who we are. Are you with me? Okay, so I am divine love. Those of you who did it with me just balanced it. If you didn't do it with me, you didn't balance it. Because hearing me doesn't heal you. I don't care who you talk to. They do not heal you without your participation and agreement in it. Period. Anybody have anything else? Yeah. Okay, so who's in charge of you? Uh-huh. Moving on. So if you're in charge of you, who's blocking you? Okay, so why would that be? What do you get by not writing? Yep, indeed. Is there anything else? It's being afraid of her power. So she sets it up so that she can't find time to write, which is bullshit because you are the masters of your own self and souls, right? So you are not finding time. And the gift in that for you is that you don't have to deal with your power because you know how powerful you're going to be when you write what you want to write through love and take it out into the world. Uh, when I was getting ready to write Conscious Creation, I had rewritten it about four times because it's all channeled information. And I had a celebrity reading on his show with John Edwards. And my, my dead husband came through. And John said, he's just showing me writing, writing. Are you writing a book? I said, well, I've been writing a book for about four years. He said, you've got to finish it, D. You have to get it out. You have to get the information out. Whether you have to start over, you have to get it out. And I'm saying that to you now. One more? Yeah. I'm having a hard time getting my vocal cords out. 
Your what group? My vocal group. Your vocal group? Yes. Okay. It's they sing songs for children. Uh huh. Oh, God, that's the highest thing. The collective doesn't want it. So, divine love. So let's ask why the hell the collective wouldn't want it, because maybe when we balance that, then you will attract the people that can get it. Okay? So, sheets, book, song. Give me a movie, any kind of movie that pops in. Ghostbusters. Okay. Well, that's because we live in a society and we're it. We've created the society we live in. So anything you don't like about our society or our country, uh, look to yourself because you represent everything outside of you. So we live in a society and we've set up a society that likes to conquer we like to conquer things. We like to win things. We like to go, there's a monster out there somewhere, and I'm going to find it. Like, why can't I write? That's a monster. You know, I, on one of my uh, talk shows, somebody called in and uh, said, look, I don't even believe in the dark side, but all this Satan shit's coming up. And I said, okay, well, what's the highest thing that we can remember about Satan? And you know what it was? just another monster D it's just another monster movie mm -hmm. but we like to keep our monsters alive because we like to conquer the thrill of you know going in and having the Ghostbusters oh, God all this stuff's coming in now okay so we have a society that thinks they have to conquer their children when you shift your perspective from having to save them and, mm, and uh, just know that you are there to help them remember the magnificence of who they are, then you will get your program out. But you don't need to save these kids. They came in to save us. Big time. Is there anything else? Okay, so she wanted me to give you this um, breathing exercise. It's so easy that most of you will go, <gasps> what? And probably not do it, but I'll give it to you anyway. So uh, think of something that you want, you want to create. Think of something that you want to create. Okay, now bring it into the present because if you keep thinking of it in the future, every time you get to the future, it's got to move further to the future. Are you with me? Okay. So you take a deep breath in to the count of three or four. And with a smile on your face as you exhale, you go, I am, and state what you just came up with. Now, again, take a deep breath in to the count of three or four with a smile on your face. You exhale, I am that, whatever that is. Okay, so you're not... If you do that 10 minutes a day, no more than 20, this was given to me by a group of psychoimmunologists, and they were amazed to find that that one simple exercise reversed most illnesses to some degree that they were dealing with. So just a little testimony to the work I've cured myself from high blood pressure, high cholesterol, thyroid, which they say you will never get off of once you go on. Uh, almost all of my clients are off all their depression medicine um, because when you let your bullshit and your fears go, your body goes, right? So... Um, I don't get out of bed till I do that exercise. So, for example, if you want money, and who doesn't? I, I have issue with the word abundance because, really, we want fucking money. <laughs> right? I mean, we want abundance everywhere, but when we say abundance, we're all thinking money. Right? So, what happens is you do this for a certain amount of time, and then when you viscerally get it, you reach what Abraham Hicks calls the tipping point. And you go, oh, 
I'm it. I'm the presence. I'm the energy. I am money. I don't get money. I don't make money. I am literally the energy of money. And when that happens, you get really excited about creating and completing more things than you ever thought you'd have the energy to do. I have created more this year than any other year in my life. Didn't know how. I just, a divine idea would come in and I'd go, if I don't know how to do it technically, I'm going to find somebody that does. But not, you don't come up with the blocks. And when you come up to a block, you go, oh, oh, oh good, another pony. <laughs> another pony that's going to help me get out of my shit. All I have to do is figure out what the block is and let it go. Right? Because my I am presence is the greatest force in this world. Nothing... Nothing, not a thought, not an action, not another person, not a rape, not a sodomy, not a divorce, nothing that's happened or can happen is greater than my I am presence in the direction of it, period. And when you find that power, everything will be done like that. Thank you.